Hello, this is Akram Jafar, and today I'm going to deal with picture tests and practical anatomy of the part. This video is on the heart, part 2. You may use the video as a revision or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, pause the video and spend some time to read the question and come up with the answer. Then replay the video to confirm your answer by listening to the comments and explanations. In this coronary artery bypass grafting image, identify the structures 1 to 3 and identify the chambers A to C. In some patients with severe angina pectoris, a coronary artery bypass grafting or cabbage operation is carried out. A segment of vein, usually the great saphenous vein, is connected to the aorta. This is the ascending aorta, labeled 2. And then to the coronary artery beyond the occlusion, therefore bypassing the narrowing. Sometimes a segment of the internal thoracic artery, internal mammary artery, or the radial artery can be used instead of vein graft. The retractor in the upper part of the picture is retracting the left lung, which is labeled 1. Note its mottled surface because of the carbon particles in its wall. Now this is the direction of the ascending aorta and this will be the direction of the pulmonary trunk. Not very clear because the great amount of fat which is present in the pericardium. Note the, also note the glistening of the visceral layer of the serous pericardium that is directly applied to the heart. The pulmonary trunk arises from the right ventricle which is labeled here as B and at the bottom of the picture Three is the fibrous pericardium, which has been cut here in order to access the heart. You can see here the cut pericardium. This is the layer that is formed by the fibrous pericardium and parietal layer of serous pericardium. Regarding the chamber A, this is the right atrium, located to the right of the right ventricle. Note that the right ventricle forms most of the anterior surface of the heart. To the left of it, there is a narrow strip of the left ventricle, which is marked here as C. In fact, C is located at the tip of the left ventricle, the apex of the heart. The photomicrograph represents which of the numbered structures 1 to 4 indicated on the dissected body. Now, the photomicrograph shows the wall of an artery. At least in this view, this can be confirmed by the thickness of the wall, the presence of an internal elastic lamina, and this is located at the border between the tunica intima and the tunica media. Note that there is a thick tunica media which contains multiple layers of smooth muscle fibers mainly, and this can be told by the flattened oval nuclei of these smooth muscle fibers. The presence of an external elastic lamina at the border between tunica media and tunica adventitia further confirms that this is a muscular artery, a medium-sized muscular artery, or distributing artery. It is not an elastic conducting artery. In an elastic conducting artery, the entire tunica media is formed of multiple laminae of elastic fibers, so you cannot distinguish an external and internal elastic lamina because the elastic laminae are continuous throughout the thickness of the tunica media. Going back to the dissection, one is the left brachiocephalic vein. It is a vein and it doesn't match with the given histology. Two is the aorta. The aorta is an elastic artery whose structure does not match the photomicrograph. Three is the right atrium, whose wall contains cardiac muscle fibers, which are striated, branched, and have intercalated discs in between adjacent fibers. These are not the features of the muscular layer shown in this photomicrograph, because these muscle fibers are smooth muscle fibers, not cardiac muscle fibers. Four, is a ventricular branch of the right coronary artery and as in most other named arteries in the body it is a muscular distributing artery that matches the given histology in the photomicrograph identify the valve shown in the center name two branches of the artery whose opening is guarded by this valve this is a superior view of the heart showing the pulmonary trunk pulled anteriorly Behind it is the ascending aorta sectioned, and to the right, there is a stump of the superior vena cava. The valve shown here has three cusps. Each is semilunar, half moon in shape, and since it is located at the beginning of the ascending aorta, it is the aortic valve. The two branches of the ascending aorta 
are the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery. And you can see them here easily. The origin of the right coronary artery is located between the right auricle and the pulmonary trunk, while the origin of the left coronary artery is located between the left auricle and the pulmonary trunk. Identify the structure A, what is its function, and identify the structures B and C. This is an anterior view of the heart showing the anterior wall of the right atrium cut and reflected to the left. Note the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, both are connected to the right atrium. Now, because in the anatomical position, the right side of the heart is actually anterior to the left side, the right ventricle is anterior to the left ventricle. Same thing is true for the right atrium is anterior to the left atrium, which is not shown here in view. So when you open the anterior wall of the right atrium, you will face the posterior wall of the right atrium, which separates it from the left atrium. In other words, this wall where A is located is the interatrial septum, and A is a thumbprint sized depression in the interatrial septum. It is located just above the orifice of the inferior vena cava. It is oval in shape, and hence it is called the fossa ovalis. It has a prominent margin, as you can see it here, it's called limbus fossa ovalis. Limbus means border, border of the oval fossa. The fossa ovalis marks the location of the embryonic foramen ovale. This is an important part of the fetal circulation. Foramen ovale allows oxygenated blood coming from the mother, passing through the inferior vena cava, to bypass the right side of the heart and go directly to the left atrium, and then left ventricle to be pumped in the systemic circulation thus bypassing the lungs, which are not inflated and no aeration is going to take place. This foramen closes at birth, otherwise it results in interatrial septal defect. B and C are in the interior of the right atrium. C is the crista terminalis, the vertical ridge of heart muscle projecting into the right atrium and is located at the border between the smooth walled part of the right atrium called the sinus venarum part produced by the incorporation of the right horn of the sinus venosus into the right atrium and between the muscular part of the right atrium which is represented by here by the musculi pectinati in B. So musculi pectinati are in the form of a series of horizontal ridges like teeth of a comb, pectin means comb, and they represent the muscular part of the right atrium, which is actually derived from the embryonic right atrium. Musculi pectinati extend into its auricular appendage. Identify the pericardial layers 1, 2, and 3, which one of them is insensitive to somatic pain, and name the nerve involved in the transmission of somatic pain sensation when the pericardium is irritated. This is a sagittal section of the thorax passing through the heart. You can see the costal cartilages here in the anterior wall of the thorax, and you can see uh, that there is part of the lung located posteriorly here. This is the diaphragm, and part of the liver is shown here, left lobe of the liver. The main feature is the heart, and you can tell because of the presence of the trabeculi carni in the inside of the wall of the ventricle. The thickness of the wall of this ventricle goes with the left ventricle, which is the thickest chamber of the heart. And also you can see that the heart is surrounded by the pericardium and the pericardial cavity. The pericardium is a fibrocerous sac. It consists of a fibrous pericardium, which is labeled three here, it is the strong outer layer that anchors the heart in its position and is attached to the wall of the thorax by sternopericardial ligaments. ligaments. Inside the fibrous pericardium, there is a serous pericardium, which like other serous membranes in the body, like peritoneum and pleura, consists of two layers, a parietal serous layer, which is represented here in two, and a visceral layer, serous pericardium, visceral serous pericardium, which is represented in one. It covers and is directly applied to the heart. It forms the outer surface of the heart. It constitutes the epicardium of the heart. You can see that the parietal layer of the serous pericardium is effused to the fibrous layer, and there is no space in between them, but there is a space between parietal layer of the serous pericardium and the visceral layer, and this space is the 
pericardial space that contains a thin film of fluid which is secreted, serous fluid, secreted by the mesothelium, the simple squamous epithelium that lines both surfaces. That's why they are glistening surfaces. Keep in mind that the space in reality is not that big. It is very thin and contains a thin film of fluid. It's a potential space, but here it looks big because of the shrinkage of tissue that takes place during preparation of this plastinated specimen. Now, like in any other serous membrane, for example, the pleura and peritoneum, the visceral layer is supplied by autonomic nerves. So the visceral pericardium is insensitive to somatic pain, while the parietal layer and the fibrous pericardium, they are supplied by somatic nerve fibers. And in this case, the nerve that is involved in the transmission of somatic pain is the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve passes in close proximity to the pericardium and it is not only motor to the diaphragm but is sensory to the pericardium, fibrous and the parietal layer of serous pericardium as well as provides sensory innervation of the pleura, the parietal pleura, the mediastinal parietal pleura and the central part of the diaphragmatic pleura. Identify the vessel indicated by the pointer with which chamber of the heart it communicates, name the two vessels that contribute to its formation. This is a view of the inferior or diaphragmatic surface of the heart. Note the posterior interventricular groove between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. Note here that the predominant ventricle on the diaphragmatic surface is the left ventricle. This is opposite to the anterior surface of the heart, where the predominant ventricle is the right ventricle. Also, you can see on the inferior surface, the opening of the inferior vena cava, opening into the right atrium. And at a higher level, this is the base of the heart that faces the apex of the heart. It is formed by the left atrium. And you can see here the openings of the pulmonary veins, two of them. One pair of them is shown here, one on either side. The vessel is wide and short and it lies in the posterior part of the atrioventricular groove and as you can see that if we follow it it continues and stops here where it opens into the right atrium just to the left of the opening of the inferior vena cava it is the coronary sinus the coronary sinus is the main vein of the heart it is formed by the great cardiac vein which ascends the anterior interventricular groove and then turns around the left border of the heart accompanying the circumflex branch of the left coronary artery. The great cardiac vein unites with a very small vein here, which cannot be seen, it's called the oblique vein of the left atrium. And this, in fact, it marks the beginning of the coronary sinus, the union of the great cardiac vein and the oblique vein of the left atrium. Then the coronary sinus receives the middle cardiac vein and the small cardiac veins. Which part of the conducting system is located at A? List four blood vessels that open into this chamber. This is a view of the inside of the right atrium, and you can tell by the presence of the crista terminalis, the vertical ridge of cardiac muscle fibers that separates between the smooth part of the right atrium, sinus venarum part, and the musculi pectinati, the muscular part of the right atrium, which is derived from the embryonic right atrium. The SA node, or the sinoatrial node, is the normal pacemaker of the heart. It is located in the wall of the right atrium, near the superior end of the crista terminalis, just to close or anterior to the opening of the superior vena cava. So this is the part of the conducting system that is located at A, crista terminalis and the superior vena cava. The three main vessels that open into the right atrium are the inferior vena cava, the superior vena cava, the opening of the coronary sinus. This coronary sinus drains most of the blood of the heart, except that carried by the anterior cardiac veins and veni cordis minimi that open directly into the heart. The anterior cardiac veins are two to four in number. They are small and run over the anterior surface of the heart, crossing the right atrioventricular groove or coronary groove to open directly into the right atrium. So they constitute the fourth vessel that opens into the right atrium. Vini cordis minimi are small cardiac veins. They are minute vessels, cannot be seen by the naked eye, and they open directly into each of the four chambers of the heart, but specifically in the atria. Identify the valve A, how many cusps it has, and identify the structure B, what is its function.
This is a view of the anterior surface of the heart where the right ventricular wall is open to show the inside of the right ventricle. You can see the uh, outflow tract that leads to the pulmonary orifice. You can see that it is almost funnel shaped. That's why it's called infundibulum. Infundibulum means funnel in Latin. Just above it, just above this funnel, is the pulmonary orifice guarded by the pulmonary valve that leads to the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary uh, valve is a semilunar valve that has three cup-shaped or half-moon shaped semilunar cusps. The interior of the cavity of the right ventricle shows a series of muscular ridges which are called trabeculi carni. One of these ridges, as you can see it here, has broken free and it lies in the cavity attached by its two ends, one to the inter ventricular septum and the other to the anterior wall of the right ventricle. This is the trabecula septomarginalis because it extends from the septum to the anterior margin, anterior wall. It's also called the moderator band. Its function is that it transmits part of the right bundle of the conducting system of the heart. And its alternative name, moderator band, records an old idea that it prevents ventricular overdistension by connecting the anterior and posterior walls of the right ventricle together. <laughs>